Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The following is a clip from my interview with Strokes producer Gordon Raphael. If you want to see the full interview, the link is available below. When Julian was recording his vocals, was there anything unique that he would do that was different than other vocalists you've worked with? I will say that one of the highlights of Room on Fire was that Julian sat next to me in the studio in the control room. He didn't stand in the live room. He sat next to me in a chair. So I was just like shoulder to shoulder with this guy while he was singing every word on that album. That was incredible, just incredible. And then I write about this at length in my book, just the amount of tone that that guy can make with his singing instrument, the sounds that come out of him. You know, that's why everybody loves his him as a singer. It's just such a powerful voice. And his rhythm is so uncanny. He is so in control of his rhythm that he can push, 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 go like rushing ahead of the rhythm and then end up perfectly on the rhythm. And you don't know why it's, it gives you this excitement, but he knows how to do these micro subtleties with rhythm and tone that make him a jaw dropping singer, really just a one of a kind. So cool. And generally, like how many takes would he do to get something down? Was he a one or two take kind of guy or did you do a lot of takes with him? I think for the most part of what we ever worked on, he would sing a song and you do it perfectly. And I go, wow, Julian, (laughs) unbelievable. You know, we already had the sound of the mic before he did it. You know, we did a sound just, oh, the sound of the mic was perfect. He would just kill it. And I go, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we could print that. that. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. He goes, yeah, I got 10 other ways I was thinking of trying this. (laughs) 10 other ways. What do you mean 10 other ways? Okay, give me another track. And he'd do it again. Perfect, but different than the first time. And he did that 10 times. And then he would want to know which of those takes, which of those moments fit each phrase perfectly. So I would say he would do 10 takes. And not because it took him 10 tries to get the song right, but he had 10 different ways that he could approach every song And he wanted to try them all so he knew which was the best way to do it. Did he ever have any sort of expectation as to which of these ways would be the best? Or was it always kind of, let's just try this out and see what works? Not only did he not know which would be the best, but I'm sure knowing him, the the bit I know him from working with him, I'm sure he thought there were three other ways he could also do it that he kind of wished he would have tried. He just, and it bugs him to probably to this day that he didn't try it. One other way I was going to do that phrase on that song. I'm sure he's that kind of guy. That is really cool. I mean, were there any particular types of mics that he would like to use or whatever you provided him, would he just do with whatever you, you gave him? I got one funny story. The microphone I had at my studio, we weren't a rich, we, we weren't rich when we built my first studio. We had I think a $10,000 music instrument budget and we needed to get the computer sorted and the recording software sorted and people gave us some stuff and we bought the rest. And I had this like $400 condenser microphone from Audio Technica. And that was the microphone that he did the EP on and he did the parts of the album on it. And I borrowed a $3,000 Neumann microphone from my neighbor at the studio across the way. And I set it up. Julian came to do his vocal session that day. And he looked and he goes, what's that? I said, Julian, that is a Neumann microphone, man. That is a really good microphone. He says, I don't like the look of it. I don't, I get a bad feeling about that. And I said, no, man, trust me. This microphone is so awesome. You're going to love it. And he looked at me very doubtfully and a little bit angry. I said, just try it. He sang like three notes. And he said, Stop. I stopped and fuck this. I knew I hated this microphone. Get that thing out of here and get me my mic back. So wow. <laughs> that's my that's my vocal microphone story. What is Julian like as a person just to hang out with? It's very fun. Like he's extremely uh focused. If you talk with him, he really listens to you and he's very warm. I'm of a different generation than him. And he also grew up in New York City, like really in the thick of things, in the middle of things. So he was exposed to a lot of ideas very quickly, Mm. very big ideas. And when you meet a real New Yorker who grew up in New York and kind of worked their way through that system, 
they're always kind of impressive. They're like, wow. The creative relationship between the band members, is he the one directing everything or is there like an equal split with the creativity from your viewpoint? Uh, I don't know what's happening now. You know, they've been through many different evolutions. I think right now it's a very much of a cooperative where everybody's really, really just working on the same kind of level in putting ideas. I have reason to believe that when I worked with them in the first couple of records, that Julian was the composer of the band and everybody brought their own ideas to his compositions. And they all, all they loved his song so much that they were willing to like sweat until it was perfect. So there was a great camaraderie of working together with a singular vision. Hmm. But as the main composer, you know, Julian would often be the one that says, these are the chords of this song. And here's the counter melody I hear. And I have a great bass line for it. That's interesting. So, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about how upfront Julian was with you about the microphones, that was very early on in your relationship. So were you surprised at all that that early on he would be that upfront with you? After the EP, I wasn't surprised at anything. <laughs> the, EP, the EP already showed me everything I could expect for the whole time I ever worked with those guys, which was that everybody was going to want me to do things at the same time, and they were all going to be vocal about it. You know, Fab was going to tell me things about Julian's vocal. Julian was going to tell me things about Fab's hi-hat. Nick and, and Albert were going to want things brighter, notes quieter. You know, there was going to be a lot of onslaught of requests. And I had to really work hard to make sure that they each got a chance to hear those requests. So once I got into that, that's what everything was like all the time. So, I mean, I, I guess because some people would have probably been put off by like how upfront they were. Did that upfrontness actually make you closer with them that you were able to handle it? It did good things for both of us. When they realized that they could tell me things and I looked like I didn't really think that was a good idea, but I did it. And then it sounded better. And like, and then I stopped questioning them as much. I think they really loved me for that, that I would actually do the things that they wanted rather than, you know, be a boss, be like the big man who knew everything. I would actually give them a chance to try their ideas. I think that worked really well. And I learned a thing or two because there were definitely ideas I thought were just, why would you do that? And then when I heard it, I go, yeah, that's cool. Hmm. That's awesome, man. So I wanted to ask you about Reptilia. When you were recording that track, did it strike you as though it was going to be a big song? Or did you think it was just another good song from the band? I thought it was one of the most interesting and one of the most powerful. There was a lot of really incredible stuff on that album, I thought. Hmm. With Reptilia in particular, I love the guitar sound on that track. How did you get the yeah. guitar sound on that track? I think that was just, I mean, there's no tricks. The only the only trick guitar track I know of is on 1251. Hmm. And I think on Reptilia, it's just a guitar, a fuzz box, an amp. And I think I might be using two mics by then, a hmm. uh, 421 Heiser and an SM57. Could be just the 421. I'll have to look at my pictures. But imagine it's just a preamp, a mic, an amplifier, a fuzz box, and those guys knowing how to get tones out of their guitar. There was no technical tricks, no effects, no reverb added other than what might have been on the amp or not. So it's a real testament to just getting the tone and capturing it. Did you get any sort of demo before working on it? Or was that another one of the tracks where you just kind of did it? They played it for me one time and then we started recording them. I didn't have any reference or any demos or anything to listen to. It's just the way we always did everything is each sound had to be kind of perfect before we started recording. Hmm. So what's the snare sound like this? Is it this? No, it's not right. We need a different snare drum. You need to tune it differently. You need a different microphone. You need to put it in a different place. You need a different EQ. On, like everything was set before we recorded the song. Mm. It wasn't like they recorded the same way and then later we made new songs out of it. It was like everything had to be done. Luckily, it's two guitars, bass, and drums. So we're talking about 14 microphones or something like that. That each one had to be set perfectly before they would even start tracking the song. Did anybody yeah. in the band expect that song to be big? Because it is their biggest track. So I'm just curious if anybody had any thoughts it was going to be like the biggest one. 
I don't, I don't remember ever hearing a discussion from anybody. I was never part of those kind of discussions. Hmm. I think I remember them debating which should be the first single. I remember being privy to them talking in the same room as me and chatting among themselves about what they thought the first single should be. Hmm. But I never heard anyone say, this is our big song. This is our best song. There was never any talk like that on any song they ever recorded with me around hmm. that one song was better than another or that this is the one that's going to blow people's minds. I remember just liking it and liking the guitar parts. And like when I watched that video, I think that's one of the coolest music videos I know of hmm. and one of the coolest strokes videos because you can see each person doing their job like, this is what the bass is doing. You can see the fingers and all four at once. And the singer, like it's so microscopic examination of how they made that song. You can just see there's like nothing left to the imagination. It's not a technical trick. It's just look what they're doing. Can you believe what they're, and then Julian's just ferocious on that video. Everything about his singing is kind of represented, at least at that time, in the way he delivers that vocal. So I remember that my personal first exposure to the band that I remember of was Rock Band. You remember that game Rock Band? It was like yeah. it was like Guitar Hero. Were you or the band aware that they put Reptilia on that like on the original release for Rock Band? I certainly wasn't. I didn't. Know, I knew it existed, Rock Band, but I didn't know what it was. Um, I've never played a video game in my life. So really. I mean, I played Pong when it first came out. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. That was like an arcade game that was with a computer with a dot that went yeah, back yeah, and forth. Yeah. Boop, boop. I thought that was really cool. 